If you're a Christian, then chances are the enemy is working hard to get you to believe a very specific and dangerous lie that undermines your entire faith and keeps you shackled to defeat. It's so sneaky that you might already believe it. This is the Shut Up Devil Show, and I am Kyle Winkler, author of the book Shut Up Devil and creator of the Shut Up Devil app. I am all about shutting down the lies and struggles that keep you from thriving in God's design for your life, and I'm here to do it every single week with a live online audience where I teach and pray. So if you haven't yet, I'd love to have you tune in live sometime on Thursdays at 8 p.m. Central at kylewinkler.org slash live. So... The enemy is a defeated foe. We know that, right? We sing songs that boast in it. The enemy's been defeated. The Bible says it, maybe most notably in Colossians 2.15. Let's take a look here. We'll open with this verse. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So there it says it. The cross was the moment of the devil's defeat. But you need to know that defeated doesn't mean non-existent. Just like in a sport, when a team is defeated, they don't suddenly vanish. What happens is that they lose their ability to advance. They lose their influence. Well, the enemy's ultimate influence or power over people was the power to separate them from God. And sin is what he used to do it. He'd tempt into sin, and then he'd accuse of the sin. Now today, he still does both of those things. Like I said, he hasn't disappeared. It's just that for a Christian, there's no real power behind his accusations anymore. Because the moment that you said yes to Jesus, the Bible assures that your sin nature was cut away. The record of your wrongs was nailed to the cross. That's what it says there in Colossians 2.14. It says you were forever put at peace with God who no longer counts your sins against you. And that's 2 Corinthians 5.19 for those of you who want to check my work. But accordingly, because of Jesus' sacrifice, God has judged you clean, sanctified, justified, made new, made right, and the accuser has lost the power to convince God otherwise. No evidence he brings forth, no matter how real or recent it is, will get God to change his mind. God's judgment of you stands because you haven't been covered with newness. You've been cleansed from the inside out and made new. So since the enemy knows that he's not changing God's mind about you, he puts all his effort into trying to change your mind about you. He's after your mind. This is why I focus so much on his name meaning slanderer. It's why I begin my book, Shut Up Devil, with a chapter titled The Slanderer. Because the only so-called power the enemy has in the life of a believer today is the power of persuasion. He can only convince you that you aren't who God says that you are, but he can't actually do anything to change who God says you are. Still, as you know, persuasion is powerful. Persuasion is kind of manipulation. It gets people to do things. Salespeople know how to use the power of persuasion to convince people to change their buying habits. Motivational speakers sometimes harness the power of persuasion to, well, motivate people. 
sometimes stir them up into a frenzy. And the devil, who's been at this longer than anybody, uses persuasion to pull on you like a puppet, both in your emotions and behaviors. And after more than a decade of ministry and plenty of personal experience with this, I can tell you there's one common lie that he uses on Christians that I often find at the root of defeated thoughts and behavior. It's a lie so deceptive that many Christians actually think it's holy. I hear from many who believe that God likes them to think this, yet it only keeps them enslaved to defeat. So many Christians are bewitched by the devil, and there's no condemnation because many of us don't know better until we know better. Well, you're getting ready to know better. Before I name the lie, I'll describe what it sounds like. If I've heard this kind of thing once, I've heard it a thousand times in one of my digital inboxes, at least. It goes something like, Kyle, I've been a Christian for 10 years, 40 years, 5 years, doesn't matter the length. Kyle, I love Jesus. I know he has the power to break addiction, to heal pain, to change me. I've seen or heard him do it for others. Yet in all the fasting and praying and deliverance, it's still there. What's wrong with me? Am I really a Christian? That might be ringing some of your bells. But therein lies the most toxic lie the devil tells Christians. Using evidence, real stuff from your life, sure. He slanders a believer to say, you're still a horrible sinner. <laughs> and that right there, I found that sneaky lie is at the root of a lot of people's insecurity, anxiety, depression, and ongoing bad behaviors. But maybe you're asking, what's wrong with acknowledging that I am a sinner? I mean, I do still sin. So isn't that being truthful? Isn't that being humble? I get why you think that. I did for a long time. And like I said, there's no condemnation here. Shame off you. But there's a huge difference between sinning and being a sinner. And it doesn't have anything to do with how much you sin or whether it's habitual or not or whether it's intentional or not. And the reason I can say this lies at the very heart of the gospel. So let me explain. It's true that we are all born sinners by no choice of our own. Every one of us. Some call it original sin. The Bible calls it a sin nature. The sin gene, you might say, was passed on to us by our parents who received it from their parents who received it from their parents all the way back to when the first woman ate the first man at a house and home, literally, back to the fall of the first couple. And through life, we all act and react from this identity of sin that is the source of our shame and separation from God. This is why kids don't have to learn to misbehave. Nobody taught me to steal the candy from the store or take the Louisville slugger to the neighbor's stomach the one time I did it. Confession time here. I just acted out of my sin nature. We all do it, like I said. Manifest in different ways. Cain killed Abel. Noah got drunk. David committed adultery. Peter denied Jesus. Paul persecuted Christians. Different manifestations of a sin nature. To cover for this sin nature in us, God called for sacrifices which his people did for thousands of years to temporarily be covered. But the dirt remained under the cover. And the failures always came back to the surface, which is why the sacrifices had to be repeated over and over and over. So because the fall and fall and the broken break time and time again, God sent Jesus to do what we can't do on our own, to not just cover us, 
but to totally cleanse us by removing our old nature and replacing it with His nature. That's what the cross did. That's the victory over the enemy that Colossians is talking about in that verse that we read at the beginning. It's what your faith in Jesus gives you. You know, a lot of people struggle with what exactly salvation means because they confuse it with the Old Testament system. They think Jesus covered their sin nature. But yet it's still under it all. And they think then they've got to work very hard to ensure it doesn't poke its little head out from under the cover. But that's not salvation. Salvation is a regeneration. That's the theological word for it. It's the changing of something old into something new. And as I so often teach, the first six letters of the word regeneration provide perhaps the best word picture of what happens. It spells regene, R-E-G-E-N-E. Literally, you were given new holy designer genes the moment that you placed your faith in Christ's finished work. It's something only God could do. And he did it. That's why 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul boasts, For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Please understand, what happened on the cross and applied to you upon your belief was no temporary or subtle change. It doesn't represent a mere covering of sin. It's a complete undoing of it and a complete redoing of you into the identity of Christ. From old to new, dirty to clean, sinner to saint, and wrong to right. So many people struggle with such mind games and insecurity and fear and shame because they don't know what happened. So they are trying over and over in their own works and in their own flesh and strength and willpower to go from dirty to clean and wrong to right. And that's a roller coaster of ups and downs, good seasons and bad seasons. Represents the first decade of my faith. I live in so much tension and pressure trying to keep myself clean enough for God that about the only thing that remained constant in my life was the insecurity I felt about my status with Him. I kept asking, Lord, what more do I need to do? Is there a better deliverance curriculum? Would a 30-day fast instead of a 7-day fast work better? Should I spend longer in prayer, memorize more scriptures? I thought it was good to ask that question. Little did I know, that the question, what more do I need to do, was influenced by the enemy's lies as a way to beat me down and wear me out. And I'm telling you, I tried until I almost died. Friend, I say this in love. If you're a Christian and you're asking, God, what more do I need to do? <laughs> or fix or achieve or whatever to be good with you. If you're asking anything about what you need to earn, then you're not understanding what happened when you believed. And it's likely what's behind a lot of what you think is attack or struggles or battles. You have to know, and I mean no. But as a Christian, you are not still a horrible sinner. But you are forever the righteousness of God. Not because of anything you do or don't do. I've got to stress that. I know it sounds like a broken record at some times, but we got to get it because our minds have been programmed the opposite for so many years. It's going to take more than a one line or one time to undo that programming. We got to get this. You are identified with what Jesus did. The Apostle Paul understood how dangerous it is to live as a believer without the assurance of being right with God. So dangerous. That's why he likened righteousness to a piece of armor. Some of you know that I've done a whole lot of study on what's called the armor of God. It's from a passage in Ephesians 6, where Paul describes weapons as pieces of a soldier's uniform. 
spiritual weapons. He relates to pieces of a soldier's uniform. Some of you have been through my e-course on the armor of God. Well, my favorite piece of the armor is what Paul calls the breastplate of righteousness. I don't have the time to go into everything, but I'll give you three highlights as to why it's my favorite. First, the breastplate was the most beautiful piece of the armor. It was scaled with plates of bronze or iron that reflected the sun. So get some revelation from that right there. It reflected the sun. I'll come back to that, I think, by the end of the message. Second, the breastplate's purpose was to cover the most vital organ of the soldier, which is the heart. Well, all throughout the Bible, the heart is described as the core of a person. It's their identity made up of thoughts, beliefs, attitudes, and actions. Before Christ, you had a bad heart. In Christ, you've been given a good heart, a new heart. Well, Paul says that righteousness is what protects your good heart precisely because it provides the answers to the enemy's accusations. When the devil asked, did God really forgive you of that past? Or does God really love you with that issue? And then point you to all of the fruit in your life as evidence to why you aren't forgiven or can't be loved. It's the righteousness you have in Christ that answers, yes, I am forgiven. Yes, I am loved because of Jesus. Knowing your righteousness in Christ keeps you from wearing yourself out from trying to be something that you already are. That's how it protects you. Understanding righteousness as a breastplate really is your number one protection against the enemy. If for no other reason, then it takes away all the reason to try to earn anything from God. But the third highlight about the breastplate of righteousness is that it's the only piece of the armor that couldn't be knocked off, cut off, or taken off by the enemy, by any enemy. It couldn't fall off with any fall. It was fastened to the soldier. And it's the same with your righteous identity in Christ. It's not a quality that can be taken off or fall off with any stumble, but it's actually a part of who you are. There's so much to those three highlights. I know it's very rich to study it. I unpack it all and more in my Shut Up Devil book if you want to go into detail with that. But looking back into my life with the benefit of hindsight, I see how so many of my battles with insecurity and shame were all rooted in not understanding my new nature. Behind my battles was this underlying belief that I wasn't who I thought I was. Ever heard of imposter syndrome? Well, this is the biggest one. The enemy's behind it. I feared that maybe I was still struggling with things because I wasn't a real Christian and was instead really still a horrible sinner. Understanding the truth of what really happened with my salvation, the truth of my right identity in Christ, freed me from the belief that with enough willpower I could fix myself. It actually gave me something far better than becoming a better version of me. It gave me instant peace with God, which in turn gave me peace with me and peace with people. I'm telling you, this revelation did more to heal and deliver than all of the super spiritual solutions in the books that I tried. I shared this this week on my Instagram, and I know a lot of you don't follow me there. But even if you do, it's always good to hear this again. And just heads up, when I say this, it might sting for a moment. But don't tune out or close your tab. This is the truth you've got to apply to your life for healing and deliverance that lasts. Not here today, gone tomorrow stuff. Enough with that. Healing and deliverance that lasts. You ready for this? Can you handle the truth? I believe in you. 
So here we go. Some things in your past and present you can't change, no matter how hard you try. Unfortunately, a woman molested in childhood can't go back and stop the stealing of her innocence. A soldier with PTSD can't take away the things he saw on the battlefield. Nobody can re-enter the womb and change how their brain and body parts came together. Of course, God still heals, absolutely. And yes, there are psychological and medical coping mechanisms that can help. But even if you are rid of the symptoms, you still have to get to the root of what really matters. And what really matters is the shaming belief about what those symptoms said about you. What you've come to believe they mean about you. As I learned, you can't work your shame away. That's why lasting healing, freedom, deliverance, peace are all experienced only by embracing the truth that your wrong identity was replaced with Christ's right identity. This is the gospel truth right here, which will heal you far deeper and faster than anything you can ever do. Take this in. The righteousness you have in Christ means that despite wrong feelings, you are a right person. It means that despite wrong memories, you are a right person. It means that despite wrong symptoms, you are a right person. It means despite a wrong history, you are a right person. It means that you are not still a horrible sinner, but Christ writes you despite you. But Kyle, what does it mean if I still sin? It means nothing about you. I know that this is the hang-up for most of us because it seems wrong to call ourselves right knowing that we still do wrong, at least at times. And I get it, I really do. Certainly we still sin. The Bible does not assure that a Christian will never sin nor struggle. Even the Apostle John warned that those who claim to be without sin are only deceiving themselves. So this isn't saying that you don't sin. I'm not saying that you don't sin. This is saying that sin no longer defines you. It's saying that grace is greater. It's saying that you are no longer identified by sin because you are regened with Christ's identity. The sin nature was cut away and replaced with Jesus. Remember, sin isn't dead. The power of it is dead. And the power of it is its ability to define you and separate you from God. I know this is deep. And some of you are going to need to save this message and replay it a few times to really let it sink in. I had to really let this kind of a thought sink into me. I mean, this was a revelation to me that came layer upon layer upon layer and probably is still coming in certain ways. But when it clicks, therein lies your deliverance. So listen until it clicks or read until it clicks, whatever it takes, until it clicks. Anyway, it'll help you to see what the Apostle Paul encouraged in Romans 6, 11. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ. Again, he says the power of sin. But notice something else there. Paul didn't say, try to be dead to the power of sin. No, he said, consider yourself to be dead to the power of sin. Consider. It means think about. It means renew your mind to the truth that your missteps, mistakes, flaws, failures, and shortcomings do not change your status before God. If you fail in the hour after you listen to this, I hope you don't. But if you do, you don't go back 
to being a horrible sinner needing to be cleansed all over again. No, you remain God's child, God's delight, God's righteousness. I know that seems backwards, but such is life in the kingdom. So much of the kingdom is opposite of what seems right with our natural minds. Now, some of you, you can put your stones down. I'm not saying you shouldn't desire pursue growth in your life. I'm not encouraging anyone to settle in some toxic place or assume that God doesn't care whether or not you sin. You should want to be freed from the junk that hurts you or hurts others or draws your focus away from God. But I promise you, we've got to get our priorities straight here. Deliverance from what's not beneficial for you isn't going to happen by you beating yourself up or living in the pressure of thinking that God is mad at you, so you got to change or else. Not going to happen. It happens almost effortlessly as you keep your mind renewed to the truth of His love and grace, to the rightness you have with Him because of what Jesus has done for you. You know, just this week, I was on my friend Susie Larson's radio program. Susie wrote the foreword to my book, Shut Up Devil. And so she had me on the program to talk about it. And Susie always gets me thinking. She's so profound. A lot of you know that. And when we were talking, we kept coming back to the importance of a renewed mind set specifically on the love and grace of God. And I don't know if I've heard this before or what, but the illustration just came to me of a seed. The seed doesn't sprout by straining or striving in itself. It doesn't like (laughs) sprout. That's not how it works. A seed sprouts because its exterior is softened by the soil and the water around it. Well, you and I are like a seed in that regard. You can squeeze and push and as hard as you want. It's not going to get you to grow because that's not God's design. God designed us to grow almost effortlessly when we are in the right environment. And that's an environment where, that's an environment where we are tenderized by His love and grace. Cultivate that kind of environment by thinking on how much He loves you. I love how, Su- how Susie put it to me one time. She said, every time you pray, God, I love you. Maybe say back to yourself, God, thank you for loving me. At least do that until you really believe it. Okay. Let's get back to the breastplate of righteousness here. Remember I said that of all the pieces of the armor worn or held by the soldier, the breastplate was the most or only really immovable piece. It was so fastened that it couldn't be cut off, taken off, or fall off. And so it is with your right identity in Christ. It is who you are. And no body and no battle can change that. If you go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, Paul instructs, Stand therefore, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Stand therefore. In righteousness. See yourself in its beauty and glamour, protected by its weight. Leave from this message. Go about your everyday life, knowing that as a believer, you reflect the sun. Not the S U N, but the S O N. You reflect Jesus, purely and beautifully Jesus. 1 John 4 17, it says it. As Jesus is, so are you in this world. Not a sinner, but a saint. Of course, it's one thing to hear all of this, but if it's actually going to affect you, it has to get into you. Your seed has to absorb the nutrients. That's why I'm a big believer in speaking God's Word. As I explain in Shut Up Devil, Speaking God's Word activates God's design for the mind in that 
it's one of the most effective ways to reprogram your brain and thus your life. So declare this with me. At the end of every chapter in my book, I've got a declaration to really help cement it into you. So I want you to really say this with me. I am not defined by my past regrets, present struggles, flaws, or failures. But I am defined by the identity of Christ because of my belief and trust in Jesus. I am new and right in God's sight. Now, we just covered the first of 10 lies that I tackle in this book, Shut Up Devil. And you see how I tackled them. I systematically take you through truth that takes the legs right out from under the lie. And then I conclude with a declaration that helps cement that truth into you. How would you like to join me to take down the rest of the lies, such as the lie that God's punishing you or that you're unlovable or unforgivable or disqualified? You can begin your journey to lasting healing and deliverance right now with my book, Shut Up Devil, Silencing the Ten Lies Behind Every Battle You Face. I'll mail you a signed copy, and you'll even get a downloadable version of chapter one so you can get started right away if you order it on my website at kylewinkler.org slash shut up devil. If you'd rather get started through an ebook or maybe you're more of an audiobook kind of a person, it's available in those formats too on Amazon or wherever books are sold. Just search your favorite store for Shut Up Devil. The first four chapters I go through the process of renewing your mind according to God's design. Then for the final 10 chapters, each one tackles and topples a lie that after more than a decade of ministry, I found is somewhere behind about every emotional, psychological, and spiritual battle. Again, Shut Up Devil is available at kylewinkler.org slash shutupdevil or wherever books are sold. Well, that does it for the Shut Up Devil show. Remember, God is good and He is for you. And we're here for you too every week on my website at kylewinkler.org on our podcast or wherever you get your social media. And don't forget, I'd love to have you join me live sometime on Thursdays at 8 p.m. Central at kylewinkler.org slash live. And don't forget, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever the platform, tap that subscribe or follow button so that you never miss a show. See you next time.